fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Several shots were fired as President Kennedy's motorcade passed through downtown Dallas. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Can you hear something again, please? <laughs> Welcome to the Hagman Daily Show, weekdays 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And now your hosts, Joe Hagman and John Robertson. Hello and welcome to this Hagman Daily Show on Tuesday, May 15th, 2018. We got a great show lined up for you today. We got all kinds of stuff to talk about. We have uh, uh, news, continued news coming out of Jerusalem. Also check Hagman Report. There's a bunch of interesting stories that we're going to get into that are uh, good. I mean, I, it's pretty much some good news across the board. Jeff Sessions has struck down the Obama transgender prison policy, which I know President Trump tried to do in, with the military, and he was uh, overruled somehow by some uh, activists, liberally insane judges. And there is a whole bunch of other stuff going on. We're going to talk about Melina Trump in the hospital. She's going to be undergoing or has undergone kidney surgery, and she's going to be there for a few days. Our prayers are with her, and we have so much to get into. And then we're going to be joined by Pastor Mike Spaulding for the second half of the show. And he is uh, one of John's really good friends, and I, I like him a lot too. He was with us at the Occupy 2018 conference, and he's got some, some very uh, timely stuff to get into when he comes on. But John, I know you got somewhere you want to start today. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe, and it's uh, always a blessing and an honor to be here today on Tuesday, May 15th. As we begin to wrap up the Hagman Daily Show, Joe, you mentioned uh, it in the final moments of our program yesterday. We are going to, uh, effectively, listeners, we're going to celebrate our one-year anniversary, which is coming up here in about uh, about eight weeks, and we're rebranding the program, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're just going to leave it at that for now, but uh, Joe and uh, and Tech Eric and myself have been working on this for a couple of months, and uh, it's just, it's just it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, so there's so there's a little teaser for you. But you know, uh, Joe Tom Wolf died today, uh, 87 years old, and I'm going to keep this brief. But I want to mention Tom Wolf because he is one of the uh, unique writers in modern American literature who was able to encapsulate and to publicize and bring to the public as a whole, not one, but two significant moments in our culture uh, through the course of his lifetime. The first is his cult classic book, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which chronicled the uh, the goings-ons of the whole LSD scene in uh, California and New York, primarily California. Uh, and he hung around with uh, Ken Kesey and Ken Kesey's band of merry pranksters. And whenever we think of 60s subculture, we, we often think of the multicolored school bus, you know, peace, love and that whole thing. And, and it was actually Ken Kesey, another famous writer in his own right, who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which became a big famous uh, film starring Jack Nicholson back in the early 70s. But uh, Ken Kesey had what he called his band of merry pranksters. And they were a consortium of primarily west coast hippies who who painted up a bus and they toured the country and they got into all kinds of shenanigans but they were really fueled by the recent uh bringing to the public of the uh, the invention of of lsd lysergic acid dialthalamide number number 25 which in my opinion is one of the most potent uh drugs out there and it's also I would argue now, as, a, as someone who's older and hasn't touched the stuff in 25 years, that it is most likely a open portal 
to demonology and and to to uh, to foul spirits. It's it's a very very potent drug. But but back to Tom Wolf. He wrote Electric Kool Aid Acid Test. It became a bestseller, and it brought an awareness to the public of this of this uh, burgeoning subculture that that we all regard today as more or less the 1960s. But back during the 1960s, these people were just considered uh, deadbeats. So so uh, Tom Wolfe sits in the same pantheon of writers as Jack Kerouac, who uh, a decade earlier brought the whole 1950s beat generation uh, to the uh, general public's awareness. But Tom Wolfe actually did it again. In the uh, late 1980s, with Bonfire of the Vanities, and and he actually Joe uh, again encapsulated and successfully uh, publicized and brought to the the public's awareness the entire uh, Reagan era culture of the yuppie and the money driven, success driven, you know, Dockers button down shirt BMW crowd through his book bonfire of the vanities which focused on the one percent elite of new york city and their wall street cash cow so tom wolf to uh, dead today at 87 uh truly one of the late 20th century chroniclers of subcultures in america very interesting uh, absolutely and i i didn't i was not familiar uh with him with tom at all i had no idea uh, I've never heard that story before, John. So that's, uh, you know, uh, learn something every day. And uh, I appreciate that. Uh, moving forward here, just before we bring Pastor Spaulding on, because we kind of started a little late, and I don't know if Pastor Spaulding has time restrictions, so I want to make sure that we bring him on when we said we were going to. But let's cover some news real quick, if we can. HagmanReport.com, go there. You can see the exclusive reports underneath the picture uh, slide banner. I don't even know. What, what do you call that, John? What's that banner? That is a revolution slider. So quick shout out to JD, uh, JD, who was a huge part of developing the Hagman Report to where it is today because he taught me that that little picture slider thing is in fact called a revolution slider. <laughs> the revolution slider. Okay, so on Hagman Report, underneath the revolution slider, there are uh, two buttons. One says exclusive reports, and the other one next to it says in other news. And I don't think hardly anybody ever goes to that part. But I curate stories there all day long, every day, except for the weekends, unless something important is going on. But there are a few pieces I want to get into on Hagman Report. First, this is something I actually dusted off my old my Twitter account. And for some reason, it looks like I tweet a lot of stuff, but I don't know where that comes from i think it's linked to it was linked to when i used to post articles it would post those articles as tweets of mine but there is really no tweets up there i retweeted something for keith hansen on may 10th uh I retweeted something on may 4th and then february 27th was the last one i think i tweeted oh you're a twitter celebrity right now real quick so i don't know what got into joe last night tech eric gave him some high-end beef stick that he bought it at country fair and 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 joe got into the beef stick and then before we knew it he had put on all of our sunglasses and then he was parading around the studio uh, wearing his sunglasses, my sunglasses, and Tech <laughs> Eric's sunglasses. My yeah. my Twitter account is at Robertson John. If you want to see the picture, it's definitely worth two seconds of your time. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go. I did see that on my phone, but I'm gonna check it out. But so I I decided I'm going to start tweeting like a regular person. I got 7,500 followers, and I'm going to start actually tweeting. And I tweeted out a story. Uh, and I said this example of liberal insanity: California Democrats demand Christians evolve or convert to their ideology or be silenced while banning those by uh, banning those same tactics, conversion therapy, which include bans banning the sale of Bibles. So what this insane liberal ideology and law is going to do is they're going to ban any and all types of conversion therapy and in their rationale, in their uh, Twilight Zone universe they live in, apparently the Bible falls under uh, conversion therapy uh, or in the law of what is considered conversion therapy. So there's a debate now that 
Christian Bibles will be outlawed to be bought or purchased in California. How insane is this? And what they're saying here in the uh, new, the Newsbusters site has a great piece up on this. It's titled California Demands Christians Evolve. California has a hollowed but questionable reputation as the birthplace of the radical free speech movement in the campus uh, in the University of California at Berkeley. And it goes on to say they're not just shutting down conservative speakers on Berkeley campus. The state's Democrats may pass a law to shut down religious speech and create a statewide LGBT safe space. There's a new legislation proposal banning all conversion therapy as fraudulent business practice sorry about that i looked at conversion uh making me wonder if i spelled that right on the uh, on the tweet i put out but it goes on to say this it's not banning conversion all conversion therapy such as mental health providers or you know church programs the uh, you know that they send people to like straight camp i guess you'd call it but what this bill assembly bill 2943 offered is that it doesn't mention the Bible, but they are saying that, yes, you can ban the Bible because it <laughs> talks about or deals with sexual orientation. and Straight camp? Yeah, they <laughs> see... Gonna, it got to get sent off to straight camp. <laughs> <laughs> they have, they say, these Christian conservatives and lawmakers are saying that this is a very broad, dangerous law that has the chance for dramatic infringement on First Amendment rights. He was alarmed at the language that defines newly unlawful sexual orientation change efforts as including efforts to change behaviors or gender expressions or eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings towards individuals of the safe sex. That's what they're trying to outlaw. So what they're they could do is say, well, you know, the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. And because it is a sin, it's a type of conversion to try to tell somebody it's a sin and they can no longer continue to live in that sin if they're a Christian. And the Bible says just that. So it falls under the definition of a conversion therapy book. <laughs> Straight camp, where they teach you to keep your shirt tucked in at all times Eat with knife and fork and wear your seatbelt. But even worse than that, John, this this potentially is a backdoor to ban religious speech. This is where we are. You in better California. believe it is. Absolutely. And that, and by the way, uh, my opening remarks about Tom Wolf, please don't misunderstand that quick biographical insight into that that man's work. He was a major part and party to aggrandizing uh the exact warped and toxic uh, ideology that that is responsible joe to this day for promoting uh this type of of warped attitude look at the end of the day i would prefer i would hope that you call upon the name of christ and get under the sanctifying blood of jesus christ it's a journey you're not i got news for you listeners you're not going to all of a sudden be some kind of squeaky clean, I never sin, I drive the speed limit, and don't, don't, don't get me near a bottle of beer type person. You're going to go through most likely a sanctification process, and it could last years, it could last days, it could last the rest of your life. But the point is you get under the age of the blood, get into the age of grace. However, if you don't want to do that, then don't. It's that's the whole point, Joe. It's supposed to be a free country. And guess what? If people if parents in California want to send their kids to straight camp, then as long as the kid is under the age of 18 and mom and dad are paying for his shoes, his, their clothes and food and a roof over his head and probably the car payment and insurance, too, then the kid is going to straight camp. The point is, Joe. That number one, this is about uh, the 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 attack on the Christian church, and this is something that you and I will be covering until our last day on this planet. But it's also, and this is how the patriot community should read this: it's attack, it's an attack on personal liberty. Listeners, aren't you guys all getting sick and tired of the libtard faction in this country telling you how to live, telling you that they? They love you so much. They want to help you get over the hump. In fact, Christians, they want you to evolve. And these people have got their heads so far up the south side of their northbound selves that they want us to evolve, having forgotten that Christians disregard evolution. 
That's right. And it is uh, just absolutely mind-boggling. This is where they're going to go. They're going to try to legislate away free speech, and specifically religious speech, uh, through defining it as hate speech or, or some kind of, uh, you know, I guess hate speech. That's the only word you can use for it. We see this happening in Europe. We've seen this happen in Canada, where even the truth, people who state the truth, are now labeled as hate speakers, and they face time in prison. It's absolutely mind-boggling. And we have liberals who insist that people of faith or just people who are conservative change their views to conform with their own liberal view. They basically are seeking to convert you from what you believe by their own version of conformity. Uh, their own version of conversion therapy. Uh, and this was, is a measure that will outlaw your views and religious faith to boot. And yeah, that's a, that, hold on. That's a great point. That's a I'm sorry. You got me fired up here, Joe. How, okay. So how is straight camp for the fundamentalist family that that's concerned about their son or daughter's sexuality? How is that different by basic definition than what Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn got nailed talking about? Uh, when they said that uh, that half the American population will have to go to re-education centers and the and the 25 percent of the population that won't be re-educated, they'll just have to be eliminated. They'll just have to be they'll have to be done away with because because we love them so much. If they don't fit our model, our mold, well, then they've, they've got to be disposed of. <laughs> That's right. It's it's unbelievable. And uh, I don't know, John, it is you know, a battle we're going to continue to fight. We're going to see the censorship on social media. We're going to see the censorship from YouTube and the Facebooks and Twitters, and they're, they're going to continue to crack down. It's going to continue to get worse. The networks are basically, the mainstream media are rabid with this idea that even the president, they put out, I have to find the article here, but they, they're saying that the president's attacks on them is a violation of their free speech and it is just mind-boggling to see what they are able to get away with and i got to get out of using these terms uh you know insane mind-boggling <laughs> crazy uh but it, it's just so infuriating especially when we deal with this day in day out and brian stelter Speaking your favorite buddy i want to play that's a video. my boy <laughs> i want to play a quick video of him because this is something that i posted on hagman report that shows just how uh, uh, crazy these people are, but they, you know, they say President Trump is a danger to free speech. Well, they're the ones who are constantly obsessed with him, and you know, just every and anything he does, from how many scoops of ice cream to how he feeds the fish in Japan wrong, on and on and on and on. Now, this is Brian Stelter's <laughs> from CNN. He admits in this interview he's addicted to Trump. Let's take a listen. I am a Trump addict. I think I'm willing to admit that. I think all roads lead to Trump right now. But you pointed out in a recent column that that can be a problem. How so? So, I mean, and let me express my own addiction as well. You know, <laughs> my, my wife and I, we find ourselves, our pillow talk is sometimes about Trump. But, oh, terrible. Uh, but I do think that we have to acknowledge that there is so much more happening in the world than Donald Trump. And we in the media are essentially all Trump all the time. And, and frankly, it's a little rude to say this, but I think cable television is, is particularly true of cable TV. It is, yeah. yeah. And the upshot is that we risk not covering a lot of really important things at home and around the world. And we complain that President Trump is, you know, is parochial, isn't paying attention to important things around the world. And we're absolutely right. But that can also be said about us. Well, there's always been a critique of the American press that it's too focused on politics, Washington inside baseball, and not focused enough on real-world issues that affect communities. And I, I guess the point is that's even more true now because Trump sucks up all the oxygen. I, I think that's part of it. And also, I think, frankly, that there's obviously a crisis in journalism. And our old business model has been collapsing. And then along came Trump. And he's a bit of the solution to our to our business model. As long as we have cameras focused on him, then audiences will follow. No. So there you have it. <laughs> I'm addicted to Trump. Hold on a second. Hold on. Stelter's guest should have gone to straight camp. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. But the other thing I want to mention quickly, and I, I don't want to let this go before we bring on our, our dear friend, Pastor Mike. 
Um, you were talking about insanity a moment ago, Joe, and, and it got me thinking, is Gary ever going to email us? Gary, hello. Hello, I don't know that he, Gary. I don't know that he listens to the show, John. Uh, What's going down, man? No, 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 no hurtful comments, no insults lately. The last time I heard from you, Gary, you said, quote, I don't like John Robertson, and I, and I appreciate that. I want to unpack it for me a little bit, bro. Tell me the things you don't like. Yeah, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Stelter's a character, man. Maybe, maybe Gary's at straight camp. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe. Uh, and I got to apologize to our audience here. I'm, uh, I was just a little preoccupied here during the last ten minutes. I've been dealing with this bank issue for. I've been. I had two fraud issues this year. I've been dealing with this bank issue uh, over the last twelve days, where there was these fraudulent charges made on my account that. I have no idea what they were for or where they were to, but it ended up overdrafting my account. It ended up getting all these service charges, and they only refunded two of the charges. They hadn't have not refunded uh, all the service charges, and I got on the phone with them again today, and they said that they would do it, and it should be done by today. So now I go log into my online banking. Not as it not done today, there's another charge that says miscellaneous charge, which I have no idea what it is. And just when I... And, <laughs> I'm just so frustrated because, uh, you know, this bank issue has cost me over $400 yeah. this week. And now it's cost me another $60. And, you know, when, you, when you're when you living basically paycheck to paycheck and, and, and this stuff like this happens, it messes everything up. So well, no, I'm, I'm you on and fire. I bank, we bank at the I'm bank, we bank right at now. the, at the first national bank of Hitler. I had to mute out. My wife was yelling in the background. She heard me complaining about it, but I'm not here to, to, to complain. I'm just hot right now because it seems like and every time something happens with this bank, it seems like I get the short end of the stick and now it's messing up me being able to do things like pay my bills on time. And that's really frustrating. So after the show, I'm going to put it out of my mind. And after the show, I'll take my fire to their customer service. But for right well, now, I am here to complain. I have, I've had nothing but bank problems since I got to Erie, Pennsylvania, and it's in part – I don't want to say it's Joe's fault, but, but it really kind of is his fault. I've had not one but two occasions where Joe's antics and his carrying on and his clownish behavior distracts me at the ATM machine, and the ATM machine eats my card. And, you know, I mean, granted, it's funny stuff that Joe was doing, but the laughter didn't la last that long. And I don't know if any of you have ever had your card captured, but, you know, it kind of puts a puts a little cramp on your style for about a week to 10 days. Yeah. So I X'd out all the online banking. I'm not going to worry about it now, but it is just so infuriating. Like I said, when you live paycheck to paycheck, basically, uh, and, and that's because of my, my living situation and a number of other things, but uh, when when you, you just have that, you know, just enough to get by and get everything you need to take care of from your groceries to paying your bills and you have a few dollars left over each week, that's nice. But when something like this happens, it is just ridiculous. And basically now I'm going to end up being $400 in the hole and I'm going to have to find a way to make that up. So, John, uh, uh, I'm going to have you apply for a <laughs> loan and then you're going to loan me something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, Let's I'd not love, talking about money. Let's love not talk about that, money. But I don't have an ATM card. You know, our bank, Joe and I bank at the same bank, and I would not be surprised if I walked in there one fine afternoon and behind the counter was Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and Hugo yeah, Chavez. Right? These people are uh, insane. Man. You know, ha hanging out, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. We better bring our friend Dr. Mike Spaulding on to save this show, man. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I was looking to see if he was available on Skype. And let's see if he is, uh, because, yep, he's ready to go. All right, we're going to bring him on now. And Pastor Mike Spaulding, great speaker, very intelligent pastor of a church, which we're going to go see next month, and which I'm, I'm actually looking forward to that, John. We talked about this off air, but I never gave you a definitive yes or no. And then absolutely, I'm going to go because I, I need, to, need to go do things like that. And uh, <laughs> if, we, if we can keep hold of our personal finances well enough oh to get gosh, 290 John. miles into Ohio. I uh, just Pastor forgot Mike's about calling. it. Now I'm going to throw my coffee cup through my office window here. <laughs> I'm you sorry. Bring it up one enough more time. about the banking, but real quick. Uh, uh, Pastor Mike Spaulding, who is sometimes mistaken for Dr. Mike Spaulding because he does, in fact, hold uh, not I believe he holds two doctoral degrees, but he is the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel in Lima, Ohio. 
uh, also known as Lost in the Middle of America, Ohio. Uh, but he's also the host, <clears throat> excuse me, of a very popular podcast, Soaring Eagle Radio, SoaringEagleRadio.com. And you can follow our friend, uh, Pastor Mike Spaulding, at Soaring Eagle Radio on Twitter. Uh, and he runs a lot of phenomenal guests, uh, a little bit more evangelical centric than the Hagman Report, but we do share quite a bit of our Rolodex back and forth. And, and we owe Joe, uh, our our friend and brother, Pastor Mike, uh, a, a debt of gratitude because over the past two years, he really has been generous and furnished us with a with a good solid half dozen awesome guests uh, that have been on the Hagman Report. Yeah, yeah, it has. Yeah, he has. And uh, uh, again, Pastor Mike Spaulding is with us, and we're going to get a chance to go see him uh, and, and go sit down and and, and uh, attend the church that he pastors and i'm really looking forward to that and i don't know john if you uh, mentioned to pastor spaulding that i was going to be joining you but now you know pastor yep. so. hey guys awesome. how are you doing today oh i'm a little frustrated fired up for some from some <laughs> personal issues but uh it's all right we're gonna plow forward and and continue to to keep going Amen, and I'm bro. and I'm suffering from classic American smart aleckness today. So, <laughs> so, so, Pastor Mike, not to put any pressure on you, but come on in and save today's Hagman Daily Show. Let's talk about <laughs> Israel. Let's talk about let's talk about Robert Jeffries and 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 John Hagee and and what is going on with the evangelical scene over there in Jerusalem. Pastor Mike, we're going to bounce it to you. Can you sort some of this out for us, brother? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I've watched this with uh, with interest, and of course. Uh, what you have going on here, uh, John and Joe, is you have uh, competing uh, understandings of uh, what Christians should be doing uh, as a manner of ministry to all people that, that are not Christians. Jeffries uh, holds a traditional Orthodox viewpoint that we should be evangelizing anyone who has not professed Christ as, as Savior. And that includes Israel. That includes the Jews. Uh, then you have uh, Pastor John Hagee, who who holds uh, a viewpoint that I would call, at in the least, guys, I would call heretical, but I would uh, I would say borderlines uh, uh, blasphemous in the sense that, and I know that's a serious charge, and that's why I'm trying to be very careful. Uh, but I say that in the context of this, uh, Pastor Hagee does not believe that the Jews need Jesus. He does not teach. In fact, he is he has stated on numerous occasions over the years. Um, I've got an interview right here in front of me that I pulled out of my my files, and I, I've shared this before in a number of different places. Uh, <clears throat> but but John Hagee says that trying to convert Jews. Uh, to Jesus is a waste of time. Now, if, if you can imagine uh, a pastor who claims to be an evangelical wow. making a statement like that, that just blows your mind. It certainly blew mine when I read it. Um, but this is, and this is a direct quote. Folks can look this up. This was, uh, now this is some years ago, but he is, he's not backpedaled from this. In fact, he's, he's made this statement many times before. But he made this in an interview uh, to a reporter at the Houston Chronicle. He said, "The Jewish pe this is a quote, the Jewish people have a relationship to God through the law of God as given through Moses. I believe that every Gentile person can only come to God through the cross of Christ. I believe that every Jewish person who lives in light of the Torah, which is the word of God, has a relationship with God and will come to redemption. The law of Moses is sufficient enough to bring a person into the knowledge of God until God gives him a greater revelation, and God has not, end quote. Now, that is absolutely, positively, without any wavering, uh, John and Joe, uh, antithetical to what the scriptures say. There, there is only one mediator between God and man. There is only one name given under heaven by which men must be saved, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, and that includes the Jewish people as well. So th this dust-up is nothing new, really. Uh, it's, it's certainly in the headlines now because of the embassy opening and, and so on. Uh, but Jeffress, and people can say whatever they want about him, but he holds the orthodox view. 
uh, concerning evangelism to all people. Jesus himself commanded that in Matthew chapter 28. We're to go to all the nations, all the nations, <laughs> and preach and teach and baptize. And, and of course, he made that statement when he was in Israel. So, Yes, he did. Much, yeah. much to the chagrin, by the way, much to the chagrin of many of the faces in the audience at that gala event that we saw uh, live yesterday morning. Uh, uh, Pastor Mike, just for our listeners' benefit, I know you're aware of this, but let's let's cut this to brass tacks. Uh, uh, Robert Jeffries, uh, uh, at least he brought his Lord and Savior with him in his yes. opening remarks, in his opening prayer. And I'm sorry if people love uh, John Hagee and his church in San Antonio or you read his Four Moons book. That's all well and good. But that man who calls himself by the name of Christ dropped Jesus Christ at the airport yes. when he landed in Israel. I'm sorry, but that's what he did. He talked about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he he left Jesus Christ completely out of it. The, 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 yes. the, the, the divine blood that saved his soul he left that out, and I rebuke him for that. And moreover, Pastor Mike, and I'm going to hand it back to you, he also, uh, in a very slickster manner, uh, worked the Muslim contingent in Jerusalem into his prayer and his remarks, proclaiming by process of implication, but you don't have to be a, gen a genius to pick up the inference in that prayer, that in fact, Allah is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's just a bunch of baloney. So, John Hagee, he left Jesus at the door, and guess what happened when he dropped Jesus from his itinerary? Chrislam snuck in. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's troubling, and, and, and that's something, John, as you and Joe well know, is on the rise today. Uh, and, and I'm not surprised that uh, that Pastor Hagee did that. He's He has been a, a advocate of unity for the sake of unity, not unity for the sake of the gospel, or not unity for the sake of Christ or, or doctrinal uh, orthodoxy. It's been unity for the sake of unity. And, and where that leads is, that leads directly and, uh, and irrevocably to apostasy. Unity for the sake of unity is nonsense. In fact, I, I was reading, perhaps you guys did too, Joe and John, um, an article from the uh, Times of Israel that, that uh, was posted yesterday uh, where they interviewed uh, Pastor Hagee, and, and he told him, he said, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, I really felt that there was something that I should be, this is a quote from, from Hagee, that I should be doing to try to build Christians and Jews together in a dimension that was non-threatening and not trying in any way to be conversionary. Well, the context of that is he was asked about the Christians and, and um uh, Christians United for Israel organization he founded like 38 years ago. But the point that he made there is the point that you made, John, is that uh, he wants us to be united with Israel, but not in any way talk about Jesus. Now, to me, you, you have left the narrow path of being a shepherd to God's people and uh, to, to being a, a gospel uh, pastor, gospel-centered pastor, when you leave Jesus out of that. It's it's just impossible to reconcile those two views, guys. Yeah, you know, it is. And, and Pastor, I got to ask you this. The timing, the Israel coming a nation again in May 14th, 1948, there's no doubt in my mind, and I'm going to get back to, to what Kushner and, and all these other people, Hagee and, and what they're doing over there, because uh, that'll be the second part of this. But we see the May 14th, 1948 as being the day officially recognized in history as the day Israel became, established itself as a nation again. What was the purpose of putting the embassy celebration yesterday on the 70th, 70th anniversary of that day? Was that a prophetic thing? What, I mean... I, I don't know. I think there's more to it. I think there, with the peace process, uh, which I want to talk about next with Kushner and them, uh, I don't know if this was to, you know, give some sort of sign, like certain things are going to be happening soon. Uh, and this is prophetic. You got to watch it. Well, that certainly is what uh, many folks are picking up on. Uh, you guys follow some of the same um, people that I do and, and read what they're saying. And, 
And as we look at this in light of, of prophecy, uh, Israel, the, the people uh, of Israel, Jews from all around the world, were gathered back to Israel uh, for a reason. And I do believe that this ties in prophetically to what the scripture has to say. Uh, and, and now Jerusalem is being recognized once again. Uh, the scripture talks about Jerusalem being a, a uh, stumbling stone, being a, a, a rock that people stumble on uh, in, a, in a boiling cauldron. It, it's interesting to me, Joe and John, that this, this small city, it, it's, it's not metropolitan in any sense, but this small city has the attention um, of the world. All eyes are on Jerusalem, and it's been this way for a while. Now, the United States, uh, our, our current administration and past administrations, I, I don't place any, any uh, spiritual significance uh, on the fact that, that this particular president has done this. I think it's all in, in God's timing and his plan, and it's unfolding right before us. Some people try to make out President Trump to be this, that, or the other thing, and I'm, I'm not sold on that. Uh, I know that God is using him. I, I, I think it's okay to say that, that God has raised him up for such a time as this. That's fine. I have no, no issues with that. But what I see happening is that the United States is, is partnering with Israel uh, on a, a strategic level, on a geopolitical level, is important uh, for our aims and goals. As a, as a, and when I say our, I'm talking about the federal government and the people that run that, it's important for their goals and aims in the Middle East that uh, Israel remains strong. Now, will God, will God use that for His purposes? Absolutely. So, to answer your question, Joe, yes, there is significance in this, and I think that people should keep their eyes on Israel and con continue to do their research. And continue to uh, to uh, be in the scriptures and understand what's happening over there because I think the time is drawing near. Now, Hagee, interestingly enough, happens to believe the same way that I do concerning uh, eschatological uh, things, end times, literal millennial reign, Christ ruling from Jerusalem, and those kinds of things. He espouses the same uh, end times viewpoint as what Robert Jeffress does, for example. Uh, but but he misunderstands, and, and I think grossly misunderstands, uh, what we are to be doing in the world today as evangelical Christians, and he's proven that over the years. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Joe. Yeah. Yes, there is prophetic significance in this. I think it's one more step toward uh, what what we see in the scriptures being described, uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, Daniel, Isaiah, the, the, the major prophets, Jeremiah as well, spoke of a time when Messiah would rule from Jerusalem. The question is, who is Messiah? Well, we know him to be Jesus the Christ. And for Hagee to, to abdicate his responsibility to press that point for the sake of unity is just, uh, it's, well, it's beyond the pale. It's, it, well, Pastor Mike, it, it is, and I'm going to call upon your authority as, as, uh, as senior pastor over at Calvary Lima. Uh, help us out here with biblical context. Jesus himself said that that well number one that he's coming with a sword but that he would actually divide members of the same nuclear family so what i'm hearing and by the way i agree with with you and thank you for bringing the direct quotes too also but i agree with your synopsis of of what we saw from john hagee yesterday and i'm and i'm hesitant and i don't mean this disrespectfully because i know that that man has been uh, up to a point preaching the gospel since I was running around in diapers. But uh, a double, a dual question for you. First of all, Pastor Mike, help us out with the scripture about about the divisive uh, qualities of Jesus as the Christ, because because there will be division. There has to be. And that's We know that that's biblical. That's question number one. And question number two, in your personal opinion, Pastor Mike, what what happened to John Hagee? Because he was he was one of the most highly respected, highly regarded leaders of evangelical Christianity. Well, certainly going back to the 1980s. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, um, so so the first part of your question, yes, the, the Gospels talk about um, Christ being a, a rock of offense, a stumbling block, not just to the nations, not just to to um, those that are 
that are unsaved that we're trying to reach out to, but also within families uh, that that brothers would would turn against brothers, that sons against fathers, daughters against mothers, for the sake of the gospel, uh, and we certainly see that today. So so Jesus was very clear about that, and and that was all within a context. Uh, for, and and in in fact, I'm teaching through Mark the Gospel of Mark on Sunday mornings now, and we've been talking about this. Christ made it very, very clear to to his followers and to the Jews that were that were standing there uh, on that day around uh, Caesarea Philippi when he said, "Listen, if if you're going to be my followers, in other words, if you're going to be true disciples, then you need to understand what what is going to be required of you." And then he named three things. He said, "You're going to need to deny yourself. You're going to need to pick up your cross." And then you're going to need to follow me. And what he meant by that was you've got to disassociate with who you were. You've got to disown uh, your life, your person, your thinking, your acting before you placed your faith and your trust in me. So deny yourself, pick up your cross. Well, that was clearly uh, him saying that there's going to be persecution. There's going to be persecution coming simply because you name my name. And then follow me, that word there means to imitate. So we are to imitate Christ. That is the message that Jesus told the the original apostles and and the the Jews that were standing there that day. How could a pastor, a a modern-day New Testament evangelical pastor, not tell any Jew that he has an opportunity, any Israelite that he has an opportunity to talk to, friend, you need to deny yourself. You need to understand that when you do that, you will follow Christ, but persecution will come. So that's the first thing that folks need to understand about following Christ, is it comes with a cost. And and the second part of your, your question, John, uh, Pastor Hagee took what, what I describe and, and many others. He holds to a dual track or dual covenant uh, uh, soteriology or doctrine of salvation and what that means is there's one way of salvation for Gentiles and there's one way of salvation for the Jews and that's why I read that quote to you he, he, all I can uh, can say about that uh, Joe and John is that he pulled that out of thin air because he sure didn't get it from a proper uh, exegesis of, of the scriptures because there's only one name and his name is Jesus, and uh, so so John has been on this heresy uh, train for quite some time uh, when it comes to soteriology, and I I don't want to make any connections to his to his um, uh, word faith theology um, because I don't think that's warranted. Uh, I know a lot of uh, uh, pastors that are are what I would describe word faith, and they don't hold to this. Uh, to this, it's really heterodoxy. It's false, heretical yeah. teaching that that John has subscribed. And he's done this, guys. Don't. This has been for thirty years or more. So I mean, this isn't anything new. It's just it's splashed across the headlines. My hope is that the Lord will use this to wake some people up and say, "Listen, this is false teaching." We've got organizations. We uh, we support organizations. My my fellowship that I pastor, we support organizations that are on the ground, boots on the ground in in, uh, in Israel today, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and some of the other cities, and they are sharing Jesus with their Jewish brethren. These are Jews that have come to faith in Christ, and they're there sharing Jesus and encouraging people um, to place their faith in Christ. Now, that's what evangelical Christians should be doing, not telling the Jews, to me, if if you tell a, a Jewish person, well, you're fine. Just just uh, keep studying the Torah and, and continue on with what God has showed you. You are you are greasing the rails for them to bust hell's gates wide open. That's right. I want to go back to what we were talking about on the peace process. There was a few articles yesterday, uh, Pastor Spalding, that not only. Uh, And we saw them lay the groundwork during their speech, but not only talked about the historic uh, aspect of moving the embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing it as as Israeli's capital, but also that 
President Trump and Jared Kushner and others are working out a peace deal between Israel and Palestine and that it could come to fruition under this Trump administration. Now, I uh, have read a lot of prophecy in Scripture many, many times, but I do have uh, a question about this. Now, say this peace process goes through, say they actually can get it done and both sides agree, uh, does that necessarily speak of the peace agreement that's talked about in scripture or was this would this have to be like a like what the scripture says a seven-year deal or uh and then what does it look like from there going forward uh yeah yeah it's a great question joe uh, what 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 my take on that would be this if, if something like that came to fruition um my take would be this this is very clearly a dry run by our enemy to see how this is going to work out, what obstacles he may need to uh, address when the when the real deal comes. And so what I'm talking about is when the Antichrist actually comes on the scene. Uh, and, and I see it already. There are a number of uh, professing believers who have um, what are called discernment ministries that are already calling Trump the Antichrist, that uh, because of his, <laughs> well, these are my words, wild success uh, on the world stage beyond anybody's uh, imagine. I mean, right, right, everybody right. was wringing their hands, you know, Trump's going to cause World War Three. Well, yeah, okay, how'd that work out? Now we got Kim Moon John is is uh, is coming to the table. Things are, are are moving in the right direction globally speaking. So now, folks, instead of wringing their hands, now they're calling you know, well, Trump's the Antichrist and this whole because because prophetically speaking, Joe, there will come a time when there will be a peace treaty with Israel and and her neighbors that have already pledged, as everybody knows that listens to you guys. Uh, Israel's neighbors have already stated in their declarations of existence that that their purpose is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, not not allow a Jew to remain living, and uh, and if they can take America out, that'd just be a bonus. So that is there, peace and safety. And of course, you know what the scripture says: when everybody's calling for peace and safety, the Lord said, then sudden destruction will come upon you. Yeah. And and so that's that's problematic. Um, and so when we see this this peace process working out, here's what I'm looking for, Joe and John. This is what's going to differentiate uh, this process from any other before it. What was Israel uh, always willing to do and the Palestinians always accepted until they went back to uh, the Middle East? And, and and then they they rebuked it and denounced it. Israel was always willing to give up land, always willing to give up land for peace, always willing to give some portion of Jerusalem, always willing to do something along, you know, the so-called two-state solution. Well, here's what, what, what I believe. The true Antichrist will come in and make peace, and Israel will give up nothing. It'll give up nothing. And I'll tell you why. Because the Scripture teaches... God says he has given this land and this city to his people. And make no mistake, the Jews are still God's people. So the real Antichrist will come in and there will be no concessions on Israel's part. The real Antichrist will be able to bring her enemies to the table. They will all agree to get along. Now, that is a supernatural thing, don't you think? Absolutely. And just one follow-up question to that. Isn't the... Doesn't and excuse my ignorance on this, I should know this, but I can't remember the order of things. Doesn't the Antichrist reveal himself after the peace treaty's broken three and a half years oh. in after that a is, head wound? That's that is that is correct. Um, Protestant uh, theology, um, at least premillennial theology, understands the end times as as a, a seven year peace treaty. Three and a half years into that, the Antichrist demands that he be worshipped, reveals himself for really who he is. That's when the persecution of the Jews uh, begins in earnest. Uh, the judgments uh, of God are poured out. The trumpets, bowls, sealed judgments are, are poured out. And sadly, 
Joe, and, and, and I believe this to be true, I subscribe to a literal interpretation of the book of Revelation, uh, upwards of two-thirds of the population of the world is, is going to be wiped out. And, and that includes two-thirds uh, of the Jews, those that identify as Jews. And, I, and, and, and this is an important tie-in. I know we're running out of time, but this is an important tie-in. When Paul says in the, uh, to, the, to the Romans, in the book of Romans, uh, chapters 9 through 11, uh, are a, a rebuke to those that say that there's no significance to Israel today. It is a rebuke to those that hold to replacement theology. Because Paul says very clearly, God is not done with Israel yet. And he makes a statement in there that was puzzling to me in my early life as a Christian. He says, all Israel will be saved. Well, how in the world can that be, all Israel will be saved? Well, I think what he's talking about there prophetically, whether we understood it or not, was all of those Jews who, who passed through the tribulation and the fires and the judgments of the tribulation. And as it says in, uh, I believe it's Zechariah chapter 12, that they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will mourn because they recognize him as their savior. So the Jews that pass through that tribulation period will see Christ and they will come to faith in Christ and they will weep and mourn for what their people did to Jesus. So that, that kind of brings some context and background to, to the question you were asking, Joe. Yeah, and, and uh, Mike, we got another 10 minutes or so. We started a few minutes late, so if you can hang with us for another 10 minutes, we can uh, continue oh, sure. the conversation. And yeah. uh, the, the scriptures do say that Israel will be trodden down uh, yes. and that it's going to. And there are pastors and, and prophecy teachers out there who have the mindset that nothing bad is going to happen to Israel, even in the end times. And I don't understand that that. Uh, train of thought or that uh, belief system, but that they they are there, John. I don't want to uh, dominate the conversation, so go ahead. No, actually, I would prefer Joe that Pastor Mike and yourself stay on this line of dialogue. In fact, I'm going to title today's show "Embassy in Jerusalem: Blood in Gaza is the Peace Pact." Next, this is important. This is very important. Well, yeah, it, it absolutely is, and uh, I'm opening my my Bible here. Uh, just to go through the last time events properly. But yeah, it is uh, interesting times that we live in. And yesterday I had a moment when we were in, John was talking about the historic implications of what we saw yesterday and the significance of the dates. And then we read about the, the peace agreement. It made me wonder, uh, in a, also the an Antichrist. Uh, I have heard many people say that they believe the Antichrist will be of Jewish descent, possibly even Middle Eastern uh, descent or, or Arab descent. And I don't know uh, that I've, I don't know that to be true myself from reading in scriptures. I never came across that where it said that would be the case, but um, there's a lot right. of very interesting things happening right now. And who knows uh, what's what we'll know when the yeah. Antichrist reveals himself. But beyond that, I mean, I don't yeah, know. yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting theories out there. And, and um, the, the authors of those theories, they make a very good case for, for their particular viewpoint. I know Joel Richardson believes that uh, the Antichrist will be uh, Islamic, um, and, yeah. I, and I take that to mean he'll be a, he'll be a Muslim, he'll be an Arab, uh, but he will be um, a, uh, a follower of Islam. Um, I, Bill Salas and some others uh, believe a more traditional uh, viewpoint, historical viewpoint, that uh, um, the Antichrist will be Jewish. Um, I've seen arguments he'll be American, he'll be English. I mean, there's just a wide range, but the two prominent ones are he'll be Jewish or that he'll be uh, a, a Muslim. Yeah, so. Stan Deo has an interesting, uh, done a lot of interesting research on this, and I'll have to email you, or maybe I'll drop this link in Skype here once I can find it, but he put together a chart of everybody that he sees as the potential of, as candidates. And then he has all these different, uh, uh, you know, uh, things that they must meet as far as, uh, you know, they have to do this. They have to be of this lineage. They have to, you know, on and on and on and on. Uh, who is the Antichrist? That This is it right here. And, and Mike, I'm going to drop this in the Skype conversation okay, box. I don't know if you can open the yes. chat box. 
but and he believes Prince Mohammed bin Salman is going to has the best potential to be the Antichrist, and with his uh, you know rise to power out of really nowhere, and then making all these changes, aligning himself with Israel, uh, becoming more open with President Trump, and all these different things, uh, it's you know you have to ask the question. Yes, yeah, for sure, and uh, it's <laughs> it is very interesting. Um, to watch all of this unfold. I, I've said this before, guys, that th these are very exciting times. I don't get uh, uh, depressed. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not given to despair when I see all these things happening. In, in fact, uh, I look on it as a, a tremendous blessing to be living in these days, uh, to be seeing all of these things unfold and then be given uh, enough discernment and spiritual eyes and ears to to try and dissect this and then make some points because after all guys what what what, what you do joe and john you, what what you do on the on, on the hagman report doug and, and, and on all of you is you're trying to inform people educate them equip them and when they're educated and equipped they can be encouraged that they're not going to be overwhelmed by all these things because to be forewarned is to be prepared right and so Having all this information is is a wonderful thing, and it's very exciting. Uh, I appreciate what you guys do, and I and again thank you for having me on today uh, to share some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, there are certain criteria uh, that the scriptures uh, they build sort of a framework uh, to help us try and understand uh, when when we see these things transpiring. In fact, that reminds me of passage of scripture. Jesus criticized the Pharisees for not understanding the days and the times that they lived in. He said, you know, you guys can predict the weather by looking at the sky, but you can't look around you and see all of the geopolitical things happening in your midst and understand that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Well, I see that as a, as a great assignment we have today to be able to look at the news, watch what's going on. And, and of course, it's a challenge not to be deceived because there's a lot of fake and false news out there. Right, guys? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'd say uh, the majority of all news is fake. It, it's yeah. all propaganda. It's all garbage. Pastor yes. Mike, let me let me slip one more in on you. And we're, we're closing in on the, the end of the show. We've got about three minutes, uh, actually about two and a half. Uh, we'll give it to you as uh, final remarks. But Pastor Mike, you've been in the service of the Lord. You've been pastoring a long time and doing all of the things that are outside of the pulpit, the, the, the marriages, the funerals, the, the, the hospital visitations and all of the stuff that, that being a true pastor requires. Did you think growing up and, and in your younger days, Pastor Mike, that you would live in such an amazingly historic time? What we saw yesterday morning was a massive directional sign on the prophetic road. Yeah, yeah, you're right, John. No, absolutely did not. Uh, when 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 I re received the Lord by faith, uh, 1983, so 35 years ago, um, I became a born again believer. Uh, 1983, boy, those were some different times. Uh, we were we were still on the the Reagan high, and, and you know, I I. I was uh, at a place where I thought, well, you know, the Republican Party is the answer to America's problems, and and uh, you know that's laughable now, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but that's so what good that's for what you. Most, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what most uh, evangelical Christians thought, um, but slowly but surely, the Lord's brought me around and opened my eyes and and got me into the script. The scripture is always the answer, isn't it? If you'll just get into the scriptures, the Lord will speak to you and and he'll bring you along to where he needs for you to be. So anyway, guys, I, I really appreciate uh, you guys having me on and, and uh, appreciate your friendship and, and pray God's favor and blessings upon you. Well, thank you so much, and God bless you, Pastor Mike. We appreciate your time and, and coming on and sharing your uh, wisdom with us, and hopefully that gives us a, a clearer picture of, of what's happening, and we'll continue to pay very close attention to all the events that have been unfolding, and it is interesting and amazing times to live in, as we all agree our sponsor simplycleanfoods.net if you want to support us do so through supporting our sponsor simplycleanfoods.net 
GMO free, one ingredient per food, Christian veteran owned. Use promo code Simply Clean, and they got some of their new stuff up there: the blueberries, the raspberries, the bananas, and cauliflower, and all kinds of other stuff. Pineapple. It is a great deal. Check out the Alt Media Pack for long-term storable foods. Again, promo code Simply Clean. We'll be back for more. The Hagman Daily Show is brought to you by The Hagman Report. Tune in to The Hagman Report weekdays, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, go to HagmanReport.com. That's HagmanReport.com. 